1 Samuel chapter 6, please. 1 Samuel chapter 6, and we'll read verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 13. Uh, this is a time where you can definitely think about thanking the Lord, spending time with your family. Uh, I know that there are some people who spend time with their families today. Y'all pray for them. Hopefully they'll have a good time. I thank you to those of you who chose to at least spend this time of main service with us before you spend time with your family. So I appreciate that one. I hope that the sermon, uh, you'll be able to take it with you where you can be more merry, you can be more thankful as you spend time with family. Uh, I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 6 and then we'll look at verse 13. Verse 13. The passage is about the men of Beth Shemesh and they had the privilege, they had the blessing where the Ark of the Covenant would return not to a special city like Jerusalem or to Hebron, but to their own humble little city. Beth Shemesh received the honor of receiving the Ark of the Covenant back home. If you know the story, the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, but the Lord sent judgment upon the Philistines for keeping the Ark of the Covenant. So those Philistines finally had the common sense where they were... To, they were able to send back the ark to the nation of Israel. And the place where the ark stopped was the city of Beth Shemesh. Look at verse 13. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark <laughs> and rejoiced to see it. And the ark came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemite and stood there where there was a great stone and they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kine a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Goth one, and for Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua, the Beth Shemite. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kerjath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. Can I picture how the ark of the covenant represents or it can illustrate the blessings of God upon our life? how his glory fell upon your soul, and it's as if heaven came down and truly glory filled your soul. What are the odds and the chances that the glory of God is to fall upon this place? Do you know how rare a Bible-believing church would even begin or commence in Northern California, in the Bay Area? Ask some people uh, who come from Southern California. There are more Bible-believing churches there. And people who are outside of California, if they were to think about a Bible-believing church, would only think of Southern California, not over here. This is a lost area. But don't you thank God that one time that Ark of the Covenant came past by your way and stopped right over here. Where would you be? Where would you and I be? Some of you probably would not have heard Bible-believing truth. Some of you would probably be lost in wrong doctrine. Even more so, some of you probably would have been truly lost and headed for hell had not God passed by your way, had not glory passed by your way. You were Beth Shemesh. No one heard about you. No one knows anything about you. No one gives a flip about you because they're all moving out of this area. That's how much 
they care about you. They would move out of this area. They give a flip about you. This place is doomed, headed for our hell. They're all reprobates anyway. But don't you thank God that God said, no, I see something over there. I see some people over there. There's people who want Bible-believing truth. There are people who want to get saved. I'll stop by and pass by their way. Nay, even more so, God has used this place to spread his glory even further around the world. What a blessing. What an honor to the men of Beth Shemesh. Amen. Not Jerusalem, not Zion, but Beth Shemesh. Who ever heard of a place? Some people don't even know that Berkeley is a city. Didn't you know that? When I said that uh, about the city of Berkeley, they think it's just a university name. They don't even know it's a city. That's how little people think about Beth Shemesh, but praise the Lord Jesus Christ, he turned this into something. Pass by your way. With such thanksgiving, why is it then we wouldn't want to be more involved? With such an opportunity and blessing, who wouldn't want to stay faithful? With such thanksgiving and gratefulness, why would we be depressed and miserable with what we have? I believe that if we were to brag about the glory of God, ponder on it, as the song goes, count your many blessings, why wouldn't anyone be willing to live his or her whole life, sacrifice every ounce of their aspect and body and mind, and even die for a blessing like this? Why wouldn't anyone? Oh, what glory. Yeah. And that's my title. Oh, what glory. Will you pray with me? Father, as we reach the end of the year, Lord, we want to give you the glory. You gave us such glorious things. But how often do our lives, do, do we not show you the glory? How often have we disdained your glory? How often have we belittled your glory? Our lives are not glorious representations of Jesus Christ. Remind us again what glory, what glory we have so that we can give you the full glory that you truly deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at verse 13. The gain of the glorious ark. The gain of the glorious ark. Notice, and they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. No one knew who you were. You were Beth Shemesh. No one gave a flip about you. Here you are in a nobody area, probably a wicked area, headed for hell, and no one wants to pastor a church over there, let alone be a missionary. I mean, it's a bunch of doomed liberals right here. Let them go to hell. They hate Jesus Christ anyway. And here you were just trusting in God. Here you were trying to serve him the best way that you could. In an area that was pretty much hopeless, in an area where you wouldn't picture such fruit coming out of your life, and then here you are, you're just sowing seeds, aren't you? Some of you who've been with us in the humble beginnings, some of those people would recall, nobody knew this place. We couldn't number even more than 10. That's how pitiful we were. We couldn't even number more than 10. No one gave a flip. There were even mega church buildings. There were nice church buildings who would only have a congregation of 10 people. That's how apostate and wicked this area is. It's just sowing seeds. Yeah. Sowing seeds. Every gospel tract being passed out. Just keep reading that book and praying to the Lord. Oh God, send fruit. Send fruit. Do some of you remember where you're trying to find the truth some of you put up efforts on that you're sowing seeds you're planting you're tilling you're working hard so that you can get some fruit out of your life you can find fruit in your life but in this dry wasted desert Beshemesh, there's no fruit but yet you kept tilling you kept toiling you're like there's there's something out there oh god give me fruit oh god let me taste a little bit of you. Show me the light. That dry and thirsty land. Didn't you see just a little bit of fruit over there? And then when you got that and you ate that, oh, that was sure different from your life out in the desert of sin, out in the desert of wrong doctrine, out in the dryness, 
the dry church state, the dry Christianity that you lived up to. And when you tasted that, that King James Bible, that dispensational truth, that life of a Bible believer, oh, that fruit tasted sure good. You sang songs that you never sang before. It was so different from the songs that you used to sing. You thought that you loved those old songs, but those songs now, it became disdainful for you. It had no meaning. It, it just caused more depression. It just caused more anger. It just caused more tension. It just caused more sin and lust. But then the music of the Lord, it just, it just meant something. What you thought was just plain old hymns, that's what you needed. You need something old-fashioned in your life in this day of modern technology and hyped up new stuff, new this and advertise this and advertise that. And technology keeps getting another upgrade and another upgrade. You need something old-fashioned and plain old hard preaching. And when you chewed that, when you ate that fruit, oh, it just, oh, it felt right. Oh, it tasted good. You reaped. You reaped. Here in this ministry, we've labored, we toil. How many of you have went through sufferings in your life? But you're just faithfully sowing seeds, aren't you? Just faithfully breaking up that fallow ground, aren't you? Just putting more uh, saturation in that dry wilderness, aren't you? Years and years have I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died. But Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. After years of wandering in the wilderness, you found it. After years of sowing, we planted fruit. Thank God there's a tree in this dry, barren wasteland. And what are you doing? You're reaping. You're reaping. Quite often we think about, oh no, I'm toiling, pastor. I'm toiling. You don't know what I'm going through. Oh man, it's so hard to serve God. When you concentrate on your toiling, and there's no doubt there are toils in the Christian life. There's no doubt there's suffering. There's no doubt some of you are working hard still and sacrificing some things. But bless God, you're reaping at the same time. And the reaping, oh, what fruit! Are you looking at what you've reaped or are you only looking at what you're toiling? Quite often we just look at the dry ground, dry ground, and that's why you feel like your life is dry. That's why your life is draining away in sin, in depression, in your self-loathing state. And you forgot that pile of fruit that's sitting right behind you that you reaped. Haven't you reaped something today? Haven't you reaped something today? Something that you never tasted before in your years out in vanity and pride. Oh, Beth Shemesh, haven't you reaped fruit? That's why, isn't this a ministry you want to keep on going? Isn't this a fruit that you want to keep tasting? Or do you want to continue disdaining and keep looking at your toiling and look forward to many years of toils and snares? Is that what you want? Or do you want to see years ahead of, thank God for a Bible-believing church. Thank God for a Bible-believing family. Thank God for a roof over my head. Thank God for the King James Bible. Thank God for Bible-believing truth. Thank God for good old-fashioned preaching. Good old-fashioned singing. Thank God for prayers. Thank God that I got His presence and His blessings upon my life. You want to look forward to many years of that? How was your year 2023? You see it as all toils and tears? Or do you see what you reaped? You know, the people who will protect and die and stay faithful to the ministry are those who appreciate it more. Are those who worked and sacrificed so much to reap. If you work so hard to get the kind of job that to get into years of schooling, years of training, years of working hard, sweat and tears, and then you finally got the job that you want, would anyone want to throw it away after that within just a couple of days? Or with that kind of a job that you spent years of toiling, sacrificing, and now you're reaping the blessings of it, you want to keep that job. 
in the mind of a secular lost world, anyone would. How much more so with this Christian life that Jesus bled and died for and you even sacrificed and took you years of finding and years of prayer, years of suffering, years of sowing seed. Now you got it. You worked hard. You earned it. So grab it for keeps, buddy. Beth Shemesh, you remember your humble beginnings? You remember how hard it was? All those toils and sacrifices and hardships you pulled through, and you want to waste that all away after all you've been through. After years of faith in God through the storms. After years of prayer through the hardships. After years of complete trust in God. Complete reliance on Him in a world filled with dependency and temptation. After all those years of sowing and working hard, you're not going to reap it. You're going to let it rot out in the sun and moan and groan about, oh, I got so much toils in my life. The people who will stay faithful, who will maintain the glory, who want to keep and use the blessings of God well are those who've gained it. Those who knew what sacrifices they had to make, what hell they had to go through to gain what they gained. Verse 14 through 15, the Bible says, And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there. The second point I want to cover is the gratitude of the glorious ark, the gratitude. Notice right here that it continues on where there was a great stone and they claved the wood of the cart and offered the kind of burnt offering unto the Lord and the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it wherein the jewels of gold were and put them on the great stone and the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. You can see their gratitude of the glorious ark that passed by their way. If there's one thing they're grateful for, that verse says, the cart came to the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite. And then the verse says, it stood there. <laughs> Woo! You know, Joshua, you know what that means? It means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. You know, aren't you glad that here's the blessing of God? coming by your life and sweeping upon this person's life, sweeping upon that person's life. You see the Holy Spirit moving. Sometimes he leaves a place and goes to one place and then leaves one terrain of a person who rejects God and then goes to another person who will be more receptive to him. And as that Holy Spirit's moving with those blessings, man, and the blessing of God should have passed by this place such a long time ago, such a long time ago. But thank God that Jehovah saves. And because Jesus saves, bless God, the blessing just had to stop right there. Jesus said, hey, Father, I still got souls right here who want to get saved. I got souls who are interested in you. And then the blessing says, well, they're so wicked. They're so liberal. People are moving out. Maybe I should move out too. And Jesus said, no, sir, because of me, because I can save that soul. The blessing can stop right here. The blessing can't pass by Jesus Christ. It falls under the demand of the soul that Jesus saved from hell. And after you got saved, the blessings of God had to shower on you, had to come down on you on your life. Romans 8, 28 apply to you. My God shall supply all your needs apply to you. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee apply to you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins apply to you. Rapture before this hell on earth had to be applied to you. Bless God, the blessing of God. Stop right here. Yeah, I mean right here. I don't care how wicked this place is, how shocked they are for hell. Blessing of God, stop right here. And bless God, it's still raining down on me. You know, thank God that the blessing of God didn't pass by you. How often have you not served them as well as you should? How often have you sinned? How often of a poor example you are as a Christian, let alone even a representative 
of this ministry. How poor of an example am I to represent this ministry? Oh, but thank God. The blessing of God just, just stopped here. It wouldn't pass. It wouldn't go away. It just stopped here. Jesus said, no, you're not passing by. Stop right here and stay here. Keep pouring your blessing on the children here. Why? Because Jehovah saves. Amen. How many times not only has he saved your soul from hell, but saved your life? Okay. How many times have you should have died out? How many times could the devil have gotten you? How many times could the world and the flesh already trapped you and you would have been lost in the mire with it? Had not Jehovah saved your life? So many times through the preaching of the word of God. So many times through fellow brethren around you. So many times because people praying for you. How many times has Jehovah saved your life? And the blessing of God didn't pass by you. And Jehovah said, stop here. You know, the Ark of the Covenant, here's that glorious Ark. And Jehovah saves is what's stopping that from passing by. Man, the gratitude. Oh, what gratitude. And I can see more of the gratitude where it says uh, in verse 14, where there was a great stone. When you look at verse 18, they put that in verse 18, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day. Hallelujah, the, the glorious ark, that blessing of God. You know what it's standing upon? It's standing upon a rock. It's standing upon a rock with a foundation that does not move and remains unto this day. Oh, man, that rock is Jesus Christ. I am founded upon the rock, the blessings of God. You know why I can claim Romans 8, 28? It's founded upon a rock that can never be moved. And modern Bible versions can tamper and change it all they want with Romans 8, 28. But bless God, that King James Bible Bible's preserved, and that blessing is founded upon a rock and will remain unto this day. Romans 8, 28, never passed by you. It never passed by you. It never died out. It remains unto this day, no matter how doubtful you are on God's promises. Guess what? You're wrong, and God's word is right. God's promises is true. You are false, and it will remain unto this day. It's a stone. It's a foundation. The blessing of God is locked onto his oath, his promise, and his very word. His very word where all creation had to exist because of his word. All empirical science and data like we studied this morning, it's so hard rock proof, but that can only exist because of the creation itself. Otherwise, those empirical science data could not operate without such a physical universe, physical creation. And that physical creation can only exist because of his word. Right. His word, his promise to you is stronger than any empirical scientific data and hypothesis that you can conjure up. Now, who can topple that? Now, that blessing of God is founded upon a rock. And that's why you got such gratitude. But, man, you, you know the name of that stone? <laughs> Hallelujah, that stone's name is Abel. Bless God, that stone is Abel. That stone is able to maintain and protect the promises of God and keep it still for you. It is able to keep you up. It is able to carry you through every storm. It is able to help you conquer your depression. It is able to help you conquer your sin. It is able to keep you going in life and it will last no matter how bad the economy falls apart. The blessing of God will remain unto this day. Because it is evil. What gratitude after that? What gratitude after that? Oh, better yet. Oh, it gets better. We have the last part of verse 15. Last part of verse 15. The Bible says, <coughs> And the men of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. Look at verse 14, verse 14. 
and they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kine a burnt offering unto the Lord. Oh, Beshemesh, they were so happy. They were so happy that they were cleaving on to that wood that held the promises of God, that glorious ark, God's glory. They clave onto that wood and make sure that the, that the wood carried the glory of God well. They put it upon that stone and then they offered burnt sacrifices and offering to God, thanking Him, and they were so grateful for what happened. Oh, the glory of God was accompanied by burnt sacrifices, was accompanied by people who clave onto the wood. And you, child, you got it better than the men of Beth Shemesh. Why, the men of Beth Shemesh, they had to cleave onto the wood. They had to offer burnt offering. But you and I already had a man, a man, the man. Behold the man who clave onto the piece of wood with every pain that he got and dragged that heavy old cross and offered himself as a burnt offering for you and I. That wood, he clave onto it with all his might because it carried the precious promises of God upon every soul who would receive it. If you were to put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, then he will save your soul from hell. He will secure your soul. He will cleanse you of all your sins. He will build you a home in heaven. All those precious promises of God. Why anyone would cleave onto that with every aspect of their being. Jesus did that for me. Jesus clave onto that piece of wood that held God's glory and promises on his back. He did it all for me. I didn't do a single thing. All I did was just receive it. All I did was, hey, give me, Father. All I did was receive it into my heart. All I had to do was take it for myself. And Jesus Christ was the one who brought it to me. Man, glorious gratitude because I got that glorious ark. The blessing and the promises of God. Wouldn't anyone be grateful? Ho, oh, oh, ho, what glory. Yeah. Let's look at verse 16. The Bible says, And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden emeralds, which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord, for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, and for Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the best Shemite. My third point is the giving of the glorious ark, the giving. Notice here, this is not the men of Beth Shemesh. These are not God's children here. These are lost Philistines who give to the glorious ark. You know why they're giving to the glorious ark? To not, they're not doing it to receive a blessing from God. They're not doing it to receive God's glory. They're doing it to avoid his wrath. They're doing it to avoid his judgment because that's how evil sin is, how evil the world is without God. And in a lost and dying world, in a Philistine world like this, they're giving all that they can. Why? Not to receive God's blessing, but just to avoid his judgment. They're giving everything that they've got to avoid his judgment. They're giving all their aspect and being. That's why they're all working hard for their salvation. Because they feel like that they are just so wicked that it's not that easy to go to heaven. So they have to give it all their might and all their being to gain a glorious salvation. But instead of that, they're working so hard to just avoid a vengeful, wrathful hell at the end. How many people, lost people you can see nowadays who are giving all they've got to avoid God's judgment on sin. You see starvation? Do you see famine? Do you see crime? Do you see how the world is falling apart? 
Do you see how all of creation is groaning in pain? And lost people are giving it all they got, throwing in billions of dollars, wasting hours in labs, in higher ed schools, just to do by any and every single minute that counts to avoid God's judgment on sin. You know why they produce this kind of stuff in sex ed schools and that kind of garbage? To avoid God's wrath on sin. They're giving it all they got. Throwing in all the money for programs and welfare stuff. And yet crime still grows. Yet sin still grows. Immorality keeps increasing. Why is that? They're giving it all they've got just to avoid God's judgment on sin. Know this, they're not giving all they've got to gain God's blessing. They're not giving all they've got to receive His wonderful home in heaven. They're not giving it all they've got to get something positive. It's just to avoid. Buy another minute, buy another year, buy another life to avoid God's judgment on sin. But in the end, for the wages of sin is death. Everyone dies, including the biggest billionaires. They can try to buy eternal life. They'll never get it. That's right. They all die. But they still give it everything they've got to avoid God's wrath. Can you picture those poor stricken people suffering hunger in third world countries? Giving it all that they've got to avoid God's judgment on sin starvation giving it all they got they work harder than you they sacrifice more than you they give it all they got and they don't complain as much as us spoiled americans just to avoid god's wrath and judgment on sin just to not feel that hunger just not to feel that pain in their stomach just to be full just to be full but when we're full we still complain when you and I give it all we got. We don't give it all we got to receive God's blessing, nor do we give it all we got to avoid God's wrath. But Jesus Christ gave it everything that he's got to give to you what you and I have today. You and I don't have to give anything what we got. Not a thing. To get salvation, an eternal home in heaven. To get his precious promises. It's, he just gave it to you. You don't have to give a thing. Don't get me wrong, it's true that you reap what you sow when you live in sin. You will have that. It's true if you serve God the best way you could, he'll bless you. Don't get me wrong on that. But let's also be honest that without giving a single thing that we've got, aren't we still too blessed? Yeah. Doesn't God still bless our lives? And we didn't have to give a thing like that poor lost soul out in a third world country who's giving it everything that he's got just to avoid God's wrath and not receive a blessing. Maybe we ought to be like those poor lost souls, like those Philistines. Those Philistines offer better sacrifices. They give it all they've got. They give out five golden mice, five golden emeralds and all this kind of stuff. Disgusting in their own twisted way, but yet they still give it all they've got. Those damn lost souls out there are giving out everything that they've got. You see that in the college campuses here? They're out soul winning, proselytizing more than you and I put together. And we can't even do once a week, whereas they do it nearly every day out of a weekday. You see two idiots riding bicycles with uh, white shirts and ties on? on? Those two damn souls? They give it all they got more than you yeah. Baptists. Wow. They give it all they got. Yeah. Everything that they've got. And in the end, they all send up, they'll all end up in the same burning hell. Yeah. All be at different levels. They give it all they've got better than you and I yeah. to avoid God's judgment. Maybe you and I should think like that, huh? Maybe because we just keep looking at the blessings of God, 
that that's the reason why we feel like we're more obligated to receive the blessing rather than giving anything that we've got to him? Maybe God should take away the blessing. No, we're, no, this is better. Maybe he should pour out his wrath upon his children and then we can learn to stop complaining, whining, and being spoiled and feeling obligated to receive a blessing, but just be a content to avoid the judgment of sin. Maybe your contentment life will improve after that. Maybe your satisfactory level would improve after that. If we were just content and happy to avoid his wrath and judgment. But no, we, all we saw was too many of his blessings. So it turned our psyche into a twisted way where we think that we're obligated to receive more. Think about how many times you could have been judged. Think about how many times you deserve what you got for that sin you committed, for that failure that you did for him. Just think about that for once in your life. If you were to just think about that once in your life, then wouldn't the gratitude increase? Wouldn't be more of the giving to him increase? Or have you forgotten the price of sin? Have you forgotten how much you owe to him because of how much you failed him or sinned against him? Why would anyone skip Bible reading and prayer? Why would anyone skip church? Why would anyone skip soul winning? Why would anyone skip suffering for his name's sake after knowing, after knowing what you and I truly deserved if we were to think about his real righteous wrath? Who wouldn't give it they're all. Who would dare to skip a thing to God? No, we've just been too blessed. And because of that, that's why we feel like we can skip. That's why we feel like we can sin. That's the reason why we feel like we're more free to do what our sinful flesh wants. My fourth point is the grievance of the glorious ark. The grievance of the glorious ark. Let's look at verse 19. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord has smitten many of the people with the great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kerjath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. That's unbelievable. Why would you, Beth Shemesh, out of all the cities and the people that the glorious ark of God could have landed upon, why would you now take it as grievous? Why would you now disdain it? Why would you now take lightly of God's blessing? Why would you now want to quit your Christian life because you're sick and tired of the blessing of God? Beshemesh, what happened to you? What made you end up like this? I'll tell you why. Because you misused God's glory. The men of Beshemesh, they were not supposed to touch that Ark of the Covenant, but they're like, oh, I want a peek, just a little peek, just a little bit won't hurt. And that was enough where God's blessing was no longer a blessing to them. Instead, it became a grievance to them. It became a pain to them. It became a burden to them. Is that how you feel like with God's glory and blessing on your life? Is it a burden to you? not a blessing? Is it a grief to you, not a joy? Is it something that you feel like causes more harm than good to you? Why? Why would you think that when it's not? I'll tell you why. Because you misused his blessing. It's that simple. You gave it a little peek. Just a little bit. I mean, it doesn't hurt, right? It doesn't hurt to just complain a bit. Just peek a little bit. And it's not, I mean, it's okay to uh, 
be a little bit whining about this problem. Be a little bit critical about people and how God deals with things in your life. It's just a little bit. You just peek a little bit. And that's enough for God's blessing to be a burden to you. Wow. Enough. That's just enough. Just a little complaint, just a little whining is enough for that, ble for that blessing of God to be a burden to you, not a joy. It's just a little peek. Why? Because I know God's been good to me. I don't take this ark for granted, but it's just a little sin. I know I still got that worldly attachment I got to give up. I know I still got those bad habits. I know that thing is still sin, and pastor preaches against it. You know, he preaches against smoking. He preaches against drinking alcohol. He preaches against worldly music. He preaches against some stuff I've been watching or hearing and blah, blah, blah. But it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. And that's enough for the blessing of God to be a burden on your life. Not a blessing. Just a little bit of sin. Sin always makes you unhappy. No matter how great your Christian life is, no matter how many times God showered you with his blessing, just a little bit of sin is enough to make it a grief to you. Wouldn't anyone want to be faithful? Wouldn't anyone not want to skip what God has given to them? What are the odds of a Bible-believing church? What are the odds of Bible-believing brethren? What are the odds of that book, a perfect word of God, being in your hands? Why would anyone skip reading the word of God? What about the access to talk to him when you and I are unworthy to begin with? What are the probabilities on that one? What are the probabilities, the odds on that? Impossible. Why would God want to hear a lowly cockroach that's smaller than a cockroach from his viewpoint when he fills up all the universe? Why would he want to talk to you? Wouldn't anyone want to be faithful, not skip a single thing like that? But just a little, right? I mean, it's just one day. It's just one Sunday. It's, I mean, I can always do soul winning later. <clears throat> you know, I can study the right doctrine a little later. I, it's just a little bit. I mean, I can pray. I mean, uh, I mean, drop my prayer time just a little bit. You know, it's not like as much time I prayed before, but just a little bit. I, just a little bit. And that's enough for the blessing of God to be a burden on your life. And now it becomes a burden to even come to church. It becomes a burden to just read the word of God. It becomes a burden to just even talk to him. Can you believe that? And you'd sooner pay hundreds of dollars to talk to a stinking therapist more than the Lord. Unbelievable. Why? Just a little bit. I just skip. Just skip. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Wouldn't anyone <clears throat> want to be, wouldn't anyone want to be so protective of a blessing that you've got? If you got $1 million in your account, you would do everything you can to protect it. If you got children and you love them, you would do anything to protect that child. You would do anything to protect it. And the world can call you crazy. The world can call you hateful. The world can call you unloving. But you know how rare that blessing of God is on your life. And you don't care what you're called. You're going to do whatever you can to protect it and separate yourself from the wicked world, from sin, and from all kinds of garbage out there. Let them call you hateful and crazy. But your testimony in yeah. Jesus Christ is that much precious to you. Yeah. More than gold. Your blessings that God has given to you is so weighty and so precious. You can't lose it. You want to protect it with every aspect and being that you got. But see, it's uh, just a little bit. Let's lower the standard a bit. I mean, you're kind of too strict, aren't you? You're too godly, don't you think so? You could go down to other people's worldly levels. I mean, you're not worldly like that, just a little bit. I mean, uh, you don't have to be that protective, you know. People are going to think that you're just too stingy. You're too controlling. You know, you're too paranoid. 
You know, relax a bit. You don't have to protect them from everything that they see or you watch and what they and you hear nowadays. I mean, you don't have to protect them from, I mean, uh, it's, I mean you're doing this so that they can get a good education. That's why public school is that much important to you. You're doing this so that you can provide money for your house. So that job means that much to you. I mean, you need some kind of a social life, so it's okay to hang around these worldly friends and neighbors and family it's just a little bit and that's why the blessing of God is a burden and a grievance to you this ministry the next generation is not worth protecting for you it's it, it's worth every extra effort extra suffering extra sacrifice to protect what you got Beth Shemesh because no one ever heard about you to begin with who ever heard of a Gene Kim 12 years ago? Who ever heard of such a name? It's Bethshemesh! And God passed by my way, gave me something real. How can I not protect it after that with everything that I've got? How dare can I slide a bit? How can I backslide a little bit? How can I just lower it a little bit? I must protect it with everything that I've got. And I must die and sweat for it. Why isn't is that not that much worth to you, Beth Shemesh? It's not that much worth to, worth to you, so now it became a grievance. Now the Bible-believing life, this Bible-believing ministry, your Bible-believing brothers and sisters in Christ who pray for you and care about you now become a grievance to you. This book, this precious, holy book is no longer a blessing. It's a grievance to you. God being a part of your life, yes, even through the storms and trials, is now a grievance to you. Why? Because you misused it. Just a little bit. See, just, just a little bit. Uh, and that's enough, bam, to sap you of all your blessing and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. You know, I think the reason why, I think the reason why the blessings of God are a grievance to you. If I were to look at my own heart, sure, I can put the blame on my lack of faithfulness, for skipping, for sinning, for not being committed as much, for not being careful in my spiritual warfare, being watchful of the devil's attack. Sure, I can put all the blame on that. Maybe that's why that glorious ark is a grievance to me. But if I, were, if I were to come down to the heart of the matter, I soon realize this. I soon realize how unworthy, how unfit I am to get the kind of blessings that God has given to me to speak to you today for people around the world to hear me. I am so unworthy of that. I am not suited for the task. There are too many people who, can, who deserve that more than me. And maybe that's why you feel like the blessing is a grievance to you. Maybe that's why you don't want to use God's blessings well. Maybe that's why you want it to pass by you, not because you're ungrateful, but because you feel unworthy. Because you feel like, I'm just too rotten. I'm just too different, God. Lord, that's how I am. I'm just a sinner. Lord, I'm incapable. I'm just too ungrateful. I'm human, God. I'm just too fleshly. I'm just too emotional. God, I'm just too sensitive. I'm just too bitter. God, you got the wrong person. Give it to someone else. How unworthy you and I feel of these blessings. So that's why we don't want it anymore. Can I tell you something? I know. Let's be honest. You and I do not deserve this church. I'm sure you and I can say amen to that. We don't. We don't deserve this church. We really, really don't. This church should not even begin to begin with. But for some weird reason, the Lord has given it to you, 
And here you are, he held you accountable to do things, to use this blessing well, but you and I just keep... When you do this once, trust me, you're going to put your whole thing in there after that. And because of that, we misuse God's blessing here. This blessing here now has become a grief to us. And we're like, we get so discouraged, depressed. Why bother serving God anymore? And then people can get away from church for months now. Get away from serving God for months and years. That, that happens, doesn't it? Because we're unworthy. Unworthy. Let me agree with you here. You're right. You're unworthy. I'm unworthy. I don't know why God would choose to give this blessing to you, but I do know one thing, my friend. When that ark of God with God's blessing is passing by from the land of the Philistines, and it could go to Zion, it could go to Jerusalem, it could go to many other better people, better places, but it just stopped there at your life. It just happened to stop at your life. You, you Beth Shemite. You, you. And the only reason why is because Joshua, Jehovah save, was right there and he said, stop here. That person? Uh, yep, that person right there. Uh, you know uh, her name? You know his name? Uh, uh, no, and then Jesus said, no, don't look at their names. Look at mine. Amen. Stop here. There are plenty of better people out there. The ark of God, uh, the blessings could be used, better used by a location over there, by a ministry over there, by people over there. Are you sure? And Joshua said, I'm sure. Stop right here. I choose that person, this place, this time, this period. I choose this place right here. The ark has to say, you're worthy, so I'll do it. <laughs> if I gave, if I said, stop right here, give it to me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, because I'm unworthy. Because God knows all the crud that I've done, that I will do after this preaching still. But it didn't look at my worthiness, it looked at Jesus' worthiness. So before you think that you're unworthy and you shouldn't keep doing what you're doing for the Lord. You know, slow down your service for God. Slow down your faithfulness. You think about sliding a bit or just giving up and being depressed and weary. Remember this. God's not blessing you because of you, but because of Jesus Christ, his immense grace upon your life, because he's good to you and he loves you and he still sees something that he can use you for. So you and I can't explain grace. We can't give it in Bayesian probability calculus terms on what God's grace is. It's just unlimited favor. And the blessing of God just has to stop there and give it to you. Because Jesus is worthy, I'm unworthy. That's the reason why I can be happy, be encouraged. Because he's worthy and not me. That's the reason why, brother and sister in Christ, that verse says... Who is able to stand before the Lord? You see that verse there? That's why the ark should not be here, Beth Shemesh said. Because I'm unworthy. I can't stand before the presence of the Lord. I'm unworthy. I'm not capable. That blessing should go to someplace else that is more worthy than me. But their statement overlooked someone who is worthy, and that is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I can recall if they would only know what you and I know, a question like that was similarly asked. When we look at Revelation chapter 5, oh, that book was sealed. All of it, 200 promises of, and blessings of God, huh? My eternal security, my salvation. And it was sealed. It was closed. When I look at that, I'm unworthy. When I look at that, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve a single promise of God and all I deserved was hellfire. 
that Beshemesh cried out, who is able to stand before the Lord? And you know what John said? You know what one angel said? Who is worthy to open the book? Brethren, you and I don't deserve a Bible in our hands. We don't deserve to even touch it or even look at it and glean any blessing from it. These unworthy hands, unworthy tongue to describe his word, to preach his word, to mention his word. But it's not because I'm unworthy. It's because Jesus is worthy. Who is worthy to open the book? Not you and I. And when discouragement sets in and says, you're not worthy to gain that blessing of God. And when depression comes in and says that you're unworthy to open that book. When sin comes in and says, yeah, you're definitely unworthy to open that book. When the devil whispers in your ears and say, why bother serving God as a Bible believer? Why bother keep coming to this church? Why bother volunteering for anything of God's work over here? You're unworthy. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when my Savior stepped in. And when my Savior stepped in and discouragement, depression, and Satan cried out, who is worthy to open the book? You're unworthy. Jesus said, I am worthy. I am worthy. Open that book. And Jesus Christ opened 200 promises upon my life. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. How can every aspect of my being not bow on my knees after that, not weep in tears after that, not lift up my hands after that, not give every aspect of my life, my being, sacrifice all my energy for a being like that and cry out, Worthy! Worthy! Worthy is the Lamb that was slain! How can I not give every aspect of my life and being, suffer every aspect and being of my life, give every energy that I've got for a worthy being like that? Not because I'm worthy, but because he is worthy. With every head bow and every eye shut, the altar call is open.